welcome. My name is Mark Frankel, and I am director of the AAAS program on scientific responsibility, human rights, and law. And I want to invite you to the second of our four events uh, in 2016 under the umbrella of neuroscience and society. As you hopefully know, today's to tonight's topic is growing older, cognition, and what science has to offer. Uh, the series is a partnership between AAAS and the Dana Foundation, and I want to thank the foundation uh, for its support, uh, both in terms of uh, uh, providing some of the funding and also in terms of the intellectual contribution that it makes, uh, that its staff makes to the selection of topics and the identification of speakers. Um, we're very grateful for that partnership. Uh, before getting to tonight's session, I do want to mention that we're going to host two more events in the fall, uh, one probably in September, one in October. Uh, not able to give you dates, confirmed dates yet, but one of those sessions will be on the topic of phobias. Uh, don't get scared. It's okay. Um, <laughs> And uh, the others to be determined. So we're still working on them, but uh, we know how to reach you by email, and we will let you know uh, the topics and, and when they are scheduled. Um, the, uh, somebody once said that uh, uh, aging is inevitable, but only if you don't die first. Uh, but if you do experience the normal progression, uh, aging will eventually lead to death. But before death arrives, there's a lot going on in the brain with regard to your cognitive abilities that can affect the quality of life. Um, and there are a number of things that can uh, be done to deal with uh, cognitive deficits. And we have three people tonight who are going to tell us about a lot of those, uh, as well as address some of the science behind the um, uh, rise or decline of cognitive ability. Uh, and also to talk a little bit more generally uh, about the issue as it affects society. Uh, we'll aim to end the program around 7 p.m., and then you're all invited to join the speakers and each other in a at a reception, which is just outside uh, the auditorium. You have the speaker bios in your program. That's, I hope you picked one of these up. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time uh, in my introductions of them, but uh, encourage you to take a look at the bios uh, to get a little bit more detail than I am going to uh, provide to you, uh, because we want to hear more from them uh, than me. Uh, I will introduce each speaker in succession, uh, and after the third speaker has concluded her remarks, I'll invite all of them up on the stage to have a seat, and we'll have a little conversation among them uh, with my moderating, and uh, then we'll open it up to the audience. There are two mics on each side. Uh, we ask you to use those. Uh, the event is being videoed, uh, and therefore we want to make sure that we get uh, the best quality sound we can. Uh, in terms of your involvement and participation uh, as well. Um, and that the video will appear on the Dana website, uh, typically about seven to 10 days at most uh, after the event. And in fact, they have the full five-year complement of uh, uh, sessions that we have done over the years, if you're interested in taking a look at what we've done in the past uh, and also hearing uh, some of the speakers. So without further ado, let me introduce our first speaker. Dr. Marilyn Albert is director of the Division of Cognitive Neuroscience in the Department of Neurology at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. And she's also director of the Johns Hopkins Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. Her major research interests are in the area of cognitive change with age and disease-related changes. Uh, and she has a particular interest in the early diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, she served an eight-year term as a member of the National Board of the Alzheimer's Association, and she's the recipient of three awards for her research with Alzheimer's disease. disease. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Albert. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here this afternoon and to be the first speaker. Um, I've been asked to sort of set the stage about cognitive aging, and what I'm going to talk about pretty briefly are the changes in cognitive abilities with age, uh, what we know about predictors that might allow us to maintain mental abilities as we get older, and then a little bit about the implications of that 
for strategies to maintain cognitive function optimally. Um, so first of all, the first question I want to address is whether or not, in fact, there are cognitive changes with age as people get older in the absence of disease. And I emphasize the absence of disease because if you think about it, we really need to be able to study optimally healthy individuals or subjects in order to answer that question. You probably all know that common diseases um, that people get as they get older may affect their cognition. So in order to study what happens with just aging, people have focused on optimally healthy humans and also animals, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. Because people have looked at this from many different perspectives, and my time is pretty brief, I'm going to just focus on what we know about memory, but I could also address later on maybe what we know about other cognitive abilities. And the reason that I'm going to focus on memory is that it's been studied from so many different perspectives, not only in humans, but as I said, also in animals. So when we study memory in the laboratory, what we typically do is give people something new to remember. And if we want to really stress the system, we give them a lot new to remember. So we might read them long paragraphs and say, can you tell us how much you can remember of what we told you af immediately and then maybe after a delay? And many years ago, I was fortunate to have a grant from the National Institute on Aging where I was able to ask this question of people across the age range who were optimally healthy. And this is a slide of those data. And you will see at the bottom the date on the slide, so you know that this was a long time ago. And uh, what surprised me and all of my colleagues, the little asterisks refer to when we saw significant changes with age. And we looked at people 30, 40, 50, 60, and 70. And as you can see from the slide, what we found, to our surprise, was that there were significant changes by the time people were in their 50s. In other words, by the time they were middle-aged. Now, we were very surprised at the time. This is just some exa an example of data that have replicated what we found. This is from the Baltimore Longitudinal Study. And it's looking at it slightly differently. Instead of just cross-sectional differences, it's looking at changes with age and following people. But essentially, the result is the same, that by the time people were middle-aged, they found that there were significant changes. Now, if you think about it, if you were to go in somewhere now and be tested at being asked to remember an enormous amount of information, you would probably be nervous about it. It's been a while since you were all in school. You maybe wouldn't have strategies that you um, used to use that you uh, were uncommon, you uncommonly use now. So you would be anxious. And so what people asked was whether or not these findings in humans are similar in animals. Because in animals, not only do you have the ability to overcome this issue of anxiety and socio so sociological aspects, but of course then you can look at changes in the brain very directly. And so what people have done is to compare the findings in humans and in monkeys and in rodents. And I'm just very briefly going to give you a sense of that. So you might take a young monkey and an older monkey and give them a lot to remember in the same way that you would do with a human being. And the comparison of age for monkeys is about three to one. So a 75-year-old monkey is about equivalent to, I mean, a 25-year-old monkey is about equivalent to a 75-year-old human. And when this was done, giving monkeys a lot to try to learn and remember, uh, the same thing was found, that by the time the monkeys were middle-aged, they were having difficulty learning and retaining new information. And of course, you can do the same thing with rodents, in this case, young rats and old rats. And of course, we don't give them paragraphs to try to remember and learn, but we give them mazes to, to try to perform on. And essentially, the result is the same, that by the time the animals are middle-aged, they begin to have difficulty. But the thing that is also extraordinarily common across all of these species is the, va the variability. So when I'm talking about changes by middle age, I'm talking about what's average, what's typical for groups of people, but not for individuals. And so the really important question is, what do we know about 
uh, individuals and what kind of variability occurs as people get older. And these are data from the individuals that I showed you that were in those bar graphs. And what you can see immediately is that there are people who are of all ages that are performing very, very well. So here we have a group of people who are in their 70s and 80s, and they're performing as well as people in their 30s. But the reason that the mean goes down is that there are people here who are doing less well. But you see, of course, that there's a much bigger variability among older people than among younger, younger people. But these were all optimally healthy individuals, so we know it's not the medical diseases that were causing these problems. We can ask the same thing about the monkeys. And this is a graph of what you get when you look at individual monkeys. So it looks essentially the same, that there's increasing variability as people get older, and that there are some older individuals who can perform as well as some who are younger. So just to kind of summarize, what we know is that there are cognitive changes with age, that on average, for the average people, they occur by middle age. There are, in, I'm talking particularly about memory, so in other domains, there are cognitive changes that occur at different points in the lifespan. But there's an enormous amount of variability, and some individuals <coughs> preserve function extremely well. So then the question is, what's responsible for this enormous variability? And I don't have, so the the real question is, what are the brain mechanisms that underlie these changes? And I don't have time to go into all of the details about how we know this, but essentially what we have learned is that it is not true that there's a diffuse loss of brain cells throughout the brain. We used to think that. We used to think that when people were in their 20s, they had the maximum number of nerve cells and that everybody was losing nerve cells over, over the lifespan. We now know that that's not true. We know that there are selective places in the brain where there are some nerve cell losses, but essentially the primary thing that's happening is that there are changes in physiological mechanisms that modulate the brain function, modulate the way the nerve cells connect to one another and the way transmission occurs throughout the brain. So this is actually pretty good news because if the news was that the primary cause was losing nerve cells, then there wouldn't be a lot we could do about it. But if it's modulation of function, then you can think of some interventions that might be feasible, and I'm gonna talk about that. But before I do, of course, you probably are thinking about the fact that maybe the people who maintain function with age just were lucky in their parents. So my mother happened to live to 101, she was cognitively intact until very, very, very old age. Um, so maybe that's what makes the difference. So what do we know about genetics? And this is just some example of what we know about genetics. This is looking at the heritability of memory function among twin pairs. And you see that memory function is heritable, that people who have good memory tend it to have children who have good memory, but it doesn't explain everything. As you can see here, in this one study, the heritability was 32 to 44 percent. The next study, 50 to 60 percent. So there is a lot that's explained by genetics, but it's not everything. So if we know that genetics doesn't explain all of this variability, then what that means is we can look at lifestyle factors that might be important and might be things that we could intervene on. And so that brings me to essentially the last question that I'm going to address, which is what kinds of lifestyle factors do we know about and what does that suggest about interventions that might be beneficial? The way in which that's been studied is primarily by looking at very large longitudinal studies, at least that's how it was in the beginning. And these were studies conducted all over the world. They took large numbers of people who were older, who were doing well, and they measured things about them, a whole range of things about them, what they were doing, how physically active they were, what their health was, and then they followed them over time to look for factors that might predict maintenance of mental ability. 
these studies were first done in people who were older, and then they were actually also done in people who were middle-aged. And of course, the whole idea was to identify factors that we might then use for interventions. This is just an example of the kinds of studies that were done over many, many years. Uh, you can see that they were done all around the world, and this set of studies represents 15,000 individuals, but there were many, many more besides that. So then the question was, were there any commonalities in the findings from this study? And one of the reports that addressed this issue came, was sponsored actually by the NIH, and the lead author was Hugh Hendry. And the conclusion from this original overview of these findings was that there were four primary activities that seemed to be related to maintenance of mental ability. Physical activity, mental activity, social engagement, and control of vascular risks. And it appeared, at least statistically, that each of these were contributing. In other words, if you had two of them, you're, you were more at a more beneficial position than if you had one, and if you had three, it was better than two, and so forth. So I'm just going to conclude by saying a little bit about each of these. But before I talk about them, I should emphasize that these are observational studies. And there are many things that can affect the result of a study where we're just following people over time. So I'm going to say a little bit about randomized control trials, trying to look at this more carefully, because that's what you would like to do. Uh, but I know that Dr. Bernard is going to say a little bit more about it uh, when she speaks. So what about physical activity and maintenance of mental abilities? In these community studies that I was talking about, uh, people were asked things like, how often do you walk a mile? How often do you go up and down stairs? How often do you lift heavy objects? And those kinds of things seem to be related to increased likelihood of maintaining mental ability. And what's been done to follow up on that is to do some small-scale randomized control trials. And most of them have lasted for about six, four to six months. And what they've shown is, in general, that the exercise groups seem to be, have better cognitive function, that aerobic activity is usually better than stretching, but both of those things together in combination seem to be better, and that the benefits are primarily seen in what we call executive function, and you also see changes in brain structure and in brain function. But we're not right now able to say to you, when should you start this physical activity? What happens if you start late? How much should you do? How long should you do it? And I think Dr. Bernard maybe will address some of the studies that are trying to answer that question. What about mental activity and maintenance of mental abilities? So in the studies that were done, people looked at levels of education. They looked at the kinds of cognitively stimulating activities that people engaged in, such as reading books, doing crossword puzzles, going to lectures at the AAAS. <laughs> Uh, and uh, what they found is that there did seem to be a relationship, and the, the major clinical trial that has looked at this is a study called the ACTIVE study. So in the ACTIVE study, they took 3,000 individuals across the United States, and they compared three different kinds of cognitive training, reasoning and memory and speed as compared to a control group. They had 10 sessions of training over six weeks, and then they had some booster sessions. And they looked at the benefits of that kind of training immediately, and then five years later, and 10 years later. And what they found, and I'll show you just a slide to, that summarizes it, is that there were benefits seen even 10 years later from this relatively brief intervention in both reasoning and speed and that all of the training groups seemed 10 years later to actually be doing better in terms of instrumental activities of daily living, day-to-day -day activities. And this is the slide that summarizes that. So the red line is the control group, and the other three lines are the intervention groups. And you can see that the group that seemed to benefit the most is actually the one that was trained in speed and then reasoning and then memory, but in general, they all did better 10 years later 
than, um, the, than the control group. So this is the best data that we have that if you are mentally active, then it might be beneficial in delaying cognitive decline over time. So what about um, social engagement and maintenance of mental abilities? This is actually the thing we know the least about. Um, th it's been studied by looking at how socially engaged people are, how many, what their net personal networks are, what their feelings are of self-worth, how efficacious they feel in their environment, do they think they can make a difference in what happens to them, in their mood and their anxiety. And we really don't know enough about this particular area. We certainly know that so, so people who are socially, socially isolated are much more likely to have cognitive declines and that feelings of loneliness likely related to depression has an impact on cognition. But in this particular area, there have been very, very few randomized control trials. We're looking just at this factor by itself, so we have a lot to learn in this area. Perhaps the thing that is most important from a, you know, from a physical point of view is that we do know a good deal about the control of vascular risks and maintenance of mental ability. Uh, the way that it's been looked at is to look at what happens with people over time who have high blood pressure, who have diabetes, who have cholesterol, high cholesterol, who are overweight, who smoke. And in combination, it certainly does appear that these risk factors over time are associated with lower cognitive function and that treating them and maintaining good control is very important for long-term cognition. Um, but we have trouble knowing when this intervention is particularly important. So there is clearly a relationship between the control of vascular risks and the likelihood of something like stroke, which I'm sure you know. Uh, there have been many observational studies looking at the relationship between vascular risks and cognitive decline, but the results have been pretty mixed. And we think it's because it depends on when these interventions occur. Do they have to inter occur in midlife, or can they still be beneficial in late life? And people are still studying that and trying to unpack it. So just to kind of conclude, there are multiple factors that predict maintenance of cognitive function in older per people. There's statistical evidence that shows that a combination of these factors are more effective than one by itself. But there's clearly much more work for us to do in order to be able to be prescriptive to tell you when to intervene and how much and how much of a difference that it will make. And as I said, I think that Dr. Bernard will tell you a little bit more about the studies that are ongoing. Um, I should just mention that if you want additional information about this, there are a couple of sources. So the um, AARP has several websites, the Global Council on Brain Health, Staying Sharp, AARP and Brain Health, they're now very interested in this topic and are trying to make new data available as it, be as it comes online. And um, I think also maybe Dr. Bernard might talk about this cognitive aging report um, that came out a number of years ago that's also available online. So I'm happy to stop, and um, I think I stayed within time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Albert, for getting us off to such a good start, and also for that endorsement, the plug for the AAAS sessions and their ability to improve cognition. Uh, we'll wait for the clinical trial data to come in. Uh, so I want to introduce our second speaker for this evening, Savili Yassar, uh, received her medical degree from um, uh, Summa Weiss Medical School in Budapest, Hungary. She joined the National Institutes of Health in 1990 as a Fogarty International, <coughs> Fogarty Center Visiting Fellow. She's been at Johns Hopkins Memory and Alzheimer's Disease Treatment Center since 2009 and at the Neurology Clinic since 2010, where she provides comprehensive evaluation and treatment for patients with a range of conditions that affect cognition and memory. Um, the main focus of her research is on the effects of hypertension and antihypertensive medications on late life memory disorders. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Yasser.
Thank you. I wanted to thank you all for being here tonight and uh, trying to, to understand or listen to my point of view. So as you heard, I'm, I'm a practicing geriatrician in the memory clinic, and I get a lot of questions from my patients, so I just assumed I shared the questions and what we know so far. Oops. So what I will review today, uh, one question I very often get, what can I do to prevent memory loss? So I, I thought we can talk a little bit about, we talked about exercise, cognitive uh, activity, but we can talk today about diet and a little bit about vitamin supplementation, especially vitamin D supplementation. Second questions I get very often asked from my patients, uh, I'm scheduled for surgery and I read or heard that anesthetics or anesthesia can affect my cognition. What can you tell me about that? So I will talk a little bit, I reviewed the literature, I will talk a little bit about this. And the last will be, I will review uh, questions. Can you just review my medications? Is there anything which really is bad for me? So, and I, I thought I share some information on polypharmacy and some specific medications. So, diet. So what can I do to prevent cognitive decline? So again, as I mentioned, I will review diet and uh, vitamins with focus on vitamin D. And over the years, there's a lot of information about the uh, Mediterranean diet. And when we talk about Mediterranean diet, of course, think about when you travel to, to Italy or Greece. So they use a lot of olive oil. They use a lot of fresh uh, fruit and vegetables and unsaturated fatty acids. And we know from, from history, and particularly from the cardiovascular literature, that they are very beneficial in terms of reducing cardiovascular risk factors. And the thought was that, you know, it's that it may be in, through that pathway, it can also affect cognition. So there was one big study recently published and, and done uh, actually in Europe, it's called the PREDIMED trial, of approximately 7,400 uh, participants. And these participants had high cardiovascular risk factors, so they were at higher risk for stroke and heart attack. And they were, um, they were assigned to three arms. The one was the enriched in olive oil, actually. I'm sorry, not virgin oil. It's a typo. <laughs> uh, but when you look at the numbers, they were, you had to consume one liter per week, which means one gallon a month. Good luck with that. And the second arm, but they did it, and only in Spain, of course. The second arm was they were enriched. They had enriched food with nuts, so more than three servings per week, and mainly walnuts, almonds, hazelnuts, nothing about peanuts, but so let's stick to that. And the last one was like, like a low-fat diet uh, and education about healthy uh, uh, diet. So surprisingly, or not so surprisingly, the study had to be stopped earlier. It lasted for approximately four years because they found that the two arms, the, uh, the olive oil arm and also the nut arm, did much better in terms of the primary outcome, which was uh, risk for stroke and heart attack. They had a sub-study of approximately 300 participants where they actually did cognitive testing at the beginning and four years later. Now, this population who was in the sub-study were a little bit younger, so around 60 years of age. And what they have found, again, surprising or not so surprising, that the people who were in the virgin oil group Okay, let me lean in. So virgin oil group, they did actually better on certain cognitive areas such as the frontal cognition when they compared it to the, uh, the control group. While the people who ate more nuts, they did significantly better in terms of memory. And both, uh, and the, the nut group also did better on the global cognitive function compared to the, uh, yeah, uh, compared to the regular uh, control group. So, if you are ready to eat uh, nuts, so here's your answer. I think that's, we know that can help you. So then the other issue is there were different diets are all on the horizon and all in the literature. So there was one recent study, and it's an observational study, not the clinical. So they sent um, uh, the memory of aging study, and it's up at Rush University. They sent questionnaires to participants and asked them about their diet. And uh, as, I, as I told you, the, the Mediterranean diet is high in unsaturated fat, in, uh, 
in vegetables, fruit, and fish. By the DASH diet, it's more like a dietary approach to stop hypertension, which is a little bit different. It's basically a uh, tries to have less sweets, pastries, uh, high in dairy products, and also low in saturated fats. So it's a little bit different, but the question was, is there any different uh, in terms of the two diets, in terms of uh, the cogn cognitive function? And they put the, they divided the people the, uh, in, in three groups, basically, who are really have a, a high score, who really are, are following very closely the diets, the Mediterranean and the DASH diet. And when you just look at the, uh, both diets, so the people who are at the highest tertile, they are actually, they're, they're interestingly, they're already starting better at baseline, but even 10 years after them, as Dr. Albert just pointed out, we all decline, sorry, there's no out of there. However, but when you're doing either you're eating the healthy, you know, the DASH diet or the Mediterranean diet, you're definitely declining much smaller compared to the, to the lowest group. So I think no matter what diet you choose, Mediterranean diet or the DASH diet, you will do better than, than if you don't follow it. So what about vitamin D? There was a lot of literature recently. I mean, my patient asked me, if we learned that they're maybe good for cancer or any, we know it's good for bone health and we all tell you to take the vitamin D. Uh, but there is also an issue, could it be also good for cognitive aging or even preventing dementia? And the Women's Health and uh, Initiative trial of 4,000 women uh, aged around 71 years, and these women were followed for more than eight years, and they were assigned to two arms. One group got the placebo, and the other arm got 400 international units of vitamin D3 and 1,000 milligram of calcium carbonate daily. And then they looked at cognitive function, and I can save you what you try to see, but basically, I just circled it, there is no significant, you know, P is the significance, it tells us a lot, but I can just tell you, and you need to believe me, there was no significant change between the people who had the vitamin D uh, with calcium and the people who just had regular diet. It does not mean, just pointing out what Dr. Albert said, it does not mean that vitamin D is not beneficial. Maybe it's not the right time, maybe not the right dosage. There was also a question about what about the role of the supplemental calcium. But currently what we have, I would not tell you in my clinic that you should take vitamin D to help prevent, uh, cognitive, to prevent cognitive decline. So next topic, what about anesthesia? So there's a we are getting older, we are getting more procedures, uh, and there's an increased concern about what type of the gen, particularly the gen, general anesthesia, and it can be uh, detrimental to the brain in older patients who undergo surgery. So actually there's an entity called the post-operative cognitive dysfunction, POCD, uh, which should not be confused with post-operative delirium. So it can happen, it can happen immediately, you know, after surgery. It can last for weeks or even months. Uh, it can be very mild or it can be more severe, but very often you need to do maybe more detailed cognitive testing to find it. It can come in many shapes and forms. You can have some trouble with uh, memory. You can have some trouble with concentration or executive function organization. So, and they, there is one study from 2008, which was actually interesting. So they followed like 1,000 people uh, who had elective surgery, so not emergency surgery, and mainly like orthopedic surgery, cardiothoracic surgery, and they looked at them, if they found any of this uh, POCD during hospitalization, three months after, and even one year after. And actually what was surprising even to me, that the frequency between the groups, just in the hospital or after the surgery, was actually relatively similar between the, you know, through all the different age groups. So it's, it's, it's around the same. So we all are different, you know, different age groups, we are the higher risk. However, when you look at them, the patient three months after the surgery, then the elderly are becoming a little bit more and a higher percentage of the people, like 12% of the elderly still have some of this cognitive impairment compared to the younger uh, generation. Now, the big surprise to me was that actually it affects also mortality. So when they looked at the people who have surgery and one year later they followed up and uh, there was a 2% uh, uh, mortality. Now when you have had any of this uh, 
post-operative cognitive uh, dysfunction during the hospital discharge that increased. If you had it still present at th three months, it even increased further, but it became actually statistically significant if you had it both at the hospital, uh, during the hospitalization, and even after discharge, uh, three months after discharge. So yes, it's not only about cognitive function, but it can also increase your risk for mortality. Uh, and I think it's more about the process. So when they looked at the people, you know, who is at risk for developing this cognitive dysfunction during this hospitalization? It's definitely when you're older, older age puts you at a higher risk, when you have lower education status and a history of stroke, which kind of makes sense. In terms of the mechanism, there are no clear mechanisms, uh, but the idea is maybe it's the direct effect of these uh, anesthetics. Uh, it could be made uh, it could be also that there is this, the anesthetics, they interfere with the cholinergic system, uh, uh, which is Im involved in cognitive function. And there could be also the indirect effect. When you have surgery, it's a stress on your body. You release a lot of um, uh, stress-related inflammatory markers. There was also concern, could it be when you have uh, anesthesia, you lose blood, you develop ischemia, or even there was a lot of res um, research done in terms of what type of uh, surgery you have. Is it uh, like in coronary artery disease when you get a bypass surgery? Is it off pump or are you on pump? pump, although we found out that there's actually, it doesn't matter uh, in terms of the risk. And of course, uh, guilty as charged, we doctors, we give you a lot of medications during that time, and uh, some of them are not so beneficial. And also the hospital environment is not really conducive for a, a healthy cognitive <laughs> environment. So next questions. What about Medications, so let me address the polypharmacy, talk a little bit about statins and some of the harmful medications. So polypharmacy, so as, uh, as we age, we have more chronic diseases, and with more chronic diseases, you are taking more medications. And uh, again, guilty as charged, because I'm telling you, you have osteoporosis, you need to take vitamin D, you need to take calcium, and you need to take some of these other medications, biphosphonates. So I'm already starting you with three medications, and we haven't even addressed anything, your blood pressure, your kidney, or whatever. So we define, we call polypharmacy when you have four or more medications. And again, this is, we include only the prescription, and not to mention the over-the-counter medications. And as you see, 40% of the over-the-counter medications are purchased by older people. So what is the consequence and what are the concerns is that we take two medications, they can interfere with each other, and of course some of the medication we don't really know, even we doctors don't know too much about over-the-counter medications and their mechanism of action and possible side effects. So surprisingly, when I did a little literature search to just brush up on my recent, you know, make sure I'm up to date, there are not too many studies about looking into that. And I found only actually two recent studies, and they were equivocal. One said, yes, it can affect cognition, and the other said, no, you cannot, uh, or no, it does not. So I cannot really help you too much, but I think the less is always better. So what about statins? That was a hot topic. So when I started my fellowship 15 years ago, and, and around that time, the Alzheimer's field, and that was when I started also my research, Alzheimer's field was buzzing, statin was the new wonder drug for the possible you know, prevention of Alzheimer's disease. Eventually, we were not able to prove it, and then there came some studies, you know, mainly post-marketing studies on statins. Statins are, I'm sorry, statins are medications, they are lipid-lowering medications, uh, and it's a one of the type we use. And post-marketing studies and some observational studies showed that maybe it can affect cognition in normal people. So there was an FDA warning about that. And very often, so I get actually patients ask me, you know, my cardiologist said I have some memory problems. You should ask your doctor, should you take the statins? So there was this recent very nice it's, uh, study by Ott and colleagues. It's a meta-analysis. Basically what that means when we put all these big trials, and usually randomized controlled trials, we put them all in a in a shaker, put all the data together, and then analyze it. So it increases the, the, the power. We can have more people. And in this study, we had approximately 50,000 people. And they found, and this is just a summary, this is how a meta-analysis forest plot, we call them. When you look at all the studies here, 
oops, it's funky how it looks, it's, sorry, but that's what matters. Uh, basically, this is the summary analysis, put all the information, and when it crosses this, if the reference line, when it cr this, this line crosses the middle, it means there's basically no detrimental effect of statins uh, on cognitive function. So yes, you should take your statin because it can really reduce the risk for heart attack and stroke, and it will not affect your cognition. What about harmful medications? Benzodiazepines, those are medications, and I talk about them and also about anticholinergic medication, and I will spell it out a little bit. So benzodiazepines are like Ativan, Xanax, you name it. We use them to treat anxiety and sleep. It's on the top of our geriatric beers criteria uh, for potentially inappropriate use in older uh, adults due to its numerous side effects. Really, we have a saying if uh, for every prescribed benzodiazepine, you spend one extra year in the purgatory. So it's a definitely a no-no in, in my area of work. So we really don't like it. And there are a lot of interest in benzodiazepine and, and their use and their effect on cognition, but there are a lot of uh, uh, methodological limitations because anxiety and sleep can also already precede, let's say, uh, cognitive decline or cognitive impairment. And that's why it's very difficult. What are you measuring when you're looking up medication use? Are you, using, are you really measuring the effect of the medication or are you really measuring the, the disease process itself? And this recent study uh, by Gray and Orr, which was uh, just published, in the British Medical Journal, uh, actually was able to address it. Basically, they followed people for 10 years. They excluded the, the last two years before they showed any cognitive you know, impairment. And then they looked at benzodiazepine use. They also stratified them how much they use. So they did kind of a dose response curve. And so they looked at cognitive function. And what's Again, I can just summarize it from this table, what it tells me. There was no benzodiazepines, did not affect cognitive function in any detrimental way. Uh, so that's, I don't know if that's good or bad, but it's negative. So what about, and this is my last point, what about the anticholinergic medications? So the cholinergic, uh, the acetylcholine uh, is an important neurotransmitter in the brain. And it's very, it's very, it, it's involved in our cognitive function. So it's very important. So anticholinergic medications, again, also very high on our uh, beers list, which we should not use, have an effect on the cholinergic system. Well, I'm just repeating myself. So there was one study of 400 uh, patients uh, aged around 70 years, and they looked at uh, the anticholinergic medication burden, and they looked at if there was any association between cognitive function and this is the first uh, study which also was able to look at imaging. Uh, and let me just first go through the medication. Uh, I'm getting my two-minute warning, but I'm there. <laughs> so uh, we don't always think about it, but anticholinergic medication include very simple one like uh, Benadryl or all the PM medication, Advil PM, Aleve PM, so those are, they all have Benadryl and all these, they all have anticholinergic effects. So again, we don't like to use that. Other medications also like Zantac, Ranadid, antidepressive like Paxil or Paroxetine and Nortriptyline. And some of them we use for urinary incontinence. And I haven't even put up, these were this medication from the study, some of the blood thinners like Coumadin. Also, or warfarin has also possible anticholinergic effect, although it's the, on the low end. So what they looked at, first they looked at cognitive function, and when you see that, so these are the people who had, who had a high score on the anticholinergic medication list, and when you see they did much worse on, on almost every, every uh, cognitive testing, and it was significant, and even more impressive that there is a uh, biological basis to that, that when you look at the cortex, of the brain and also the different areas, the temporal lobe and the medial temporal lobe. The people who had the uh, anticholinergic medication, again, they had also smaller areas in the brain. So not only did, did it affect the cognition, but there is a biological basis for that. So I feel a little bit vindicated in geriatrics that yes, so it's definitely, you, it's, it's, if you can avoid it, of course, these medications should be avoided. And to finish up my talk, just, 
before you go out and get your cup of coffee, fresh hot off the press. This was another uh, meta-analysis uh, of, I think, if I remember correctly, 37,000 people. And they looked if coffee affects your cognitive function. And they followed them, you know, they put it together, and they did a little dose-response curve. So this is your reference range. You know, this is where we see. So when you had, and this is the main curve, this is just the confidence interval. So look at this one. So it's actually quite beneficial. It reduces your risk when you drink at least, you know, or when you drink uh, ten, uh, one cup of coffee by 20%. And still quite good, you're okay at two cup of coffee. But when you are not at your fort, you are not doing yourself any good. And I don't even want to go, uh, shouldn't go higher. So this is really relevant because I just heard today on the radio that there is an association between caffeine use and cancer. It's supposed to be protective. I have to look at the data. So thank you so much for your attention. I don't know whether we're serving coffee at the uh, reception tonight, uh, but uh, beware. Uh, our final presentation will be from Dr. Marie Bernard, who is Deputy Director of the National Institute on Aging, uh, where she oversees over one and a half billion dollars in aging research that is conducted and supported by the Institute. Uh, she's held numerous national leadership roles, including Chair of the Department of Veterans Affairs National Research Advisory Committee, and president of the Association for Gerontology in Higher Education. Uh, she came to NIA from the academic community, where she also had a very successful career. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Bernard. Well, it's always nice to be the last person here and the only thing between you and refreshments. Um, but uh, what I've been charged to do is to talk about policy issues. Um, so I'm gonna talk about what we know, kind of recapping the things that my colleagues have just shared with you, what we don't know, and what we at the National Institute on Aging are doing about what we don't know. Um, among the things that we know is, are that, as again, Dr. Albert had mentioned, there are a number of things that seem to potentially affect cognition. There are things like exercise and dietary interventions, uh, cognitive training, there are a combination of those approaches. Um, here's an example of pretty old data from 1999 um, that shows on the left there um, that those men, it's from the Honolulu Asia, Asia study, so it's primarily, it's all men, uh, Asian men, and it looked at those who walked on a regular basis, uh, had the most in the way of walking, and it found that those people who walked, um, after having done that for a period of time, did a lot better on reaction time, on cognitive testing, than those who simply did uh, toning sorts of exercises. More recent data, this from Voss and colleagues from 2013, looks at this in a a broader group, it's a mixture of men and women, various ethnicities, uh, and looked at the impact of exercise at six months and 12 months. Um, on, the, on the left here, you see uh, what happens in terms of functional connectivity within the brain, and you see that for those people who did the walking, shown in yellow, they had better connectivity of the brain at six months and 12 months than those people who simply did flexing, toning, and balance. Uh, not to say that there isn't benefit to flexing, toning, and balance for other aspects of health, but at least in this study, uh, that it didn't do anything for connections within the brain. And in fact, at 12 months, the brain connectivity for these older adults who went through this uh, exercise regimen seemed to be similar to that of younger adults, which is shown in gray here. And in fact, the researchers measured some substances that are associated with brain uh, plasticity, something called uh, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF, uh, uh, interleukin growth factor, uh, vegetation, uh, VEGF, you know, several factors that we see changing in individuals um, after exercise, being consistent with the exercise having brought about some benefits to brain and brain function. 
Um, similarly, well, or, or following up on that, there have been, uh, there's this recent study by Vidani and colleagues that are trying to get a sense of, well, how much exercise do you have to do to really get some sort of benefit? Uh, and, in, in, and the thing that's neat about this study is that it's a community-based study where people were working in YMCAs with personal trainers, um, again, all older adults. And what they did in this study was to have some people who got um, just were told to keep up with their usual activity levels. These are generally sedentary individuals. Some individuals who were working uh, aerobically for 75 minutes per week. Uh, some people who were working or, uh, aerobically for 150 minutes per week. And as you know, the usual recommendation these days is uh, about 30 minutes per day of aerobic exercise on average about five times per week. So that's what this middle group was basically accomplishing. And then some people who really were pushing it at 45 minutes per day on average five days per week. Um, and vigorous exercise. Um, the blue line here represents um, how well the uh, cardiovascular system was stressed. And as you can see, uh, for the people who were working 45 minutes per day, they significantly increased their cardiovascular c capability. Uh, what you see in the green line is their uh, simple attention, a form of cognition testing, uh, which improved with every form of aerobic exercise uh, as compared to the control group that, in fact, somewhat declined over the period of 26 weeks or so that this was done. Um, and what you see in orange there is visuospatial processing, the ability to figure out what's here versus there versus there, which really was uh, significantly improved in those people who did 45 minutes per day, on average five days per week, but did improve uh, somewhat for people who had lower levels of exercise as compared to those who were sedentary. Um, so seemingly, definitely a dose response relationship between aerobic exercise and some forms of cognitive function, uh, but it means that you have to really push it. Um, and the, these are data only for those people who really stuck with it. Uh, if people, uh, when you took into consideration everyone who got assigned to the various groups, you don't necessarily see as much benefit. So, but it makes sense. You want to see if they did what was asked, what the outcome was. And then the, both of my colleagues have talked a bit about diet. We have an ongoing study called the MIND Diet Study, uh, Mediterranean Dash Diet Intervention for Neurodegenerative Delay. Uh, and very specifically, this is a study to see whether you can prevent people developing Alzheimer's disease. But it starts with people who are cognitively normal. Um, it's uh, gathering a group of some 600 individuals, 65 years of age and older, who are on suboptimal diets, and they get, and Dr. Albert described very nicely what's the Mediterranean diet and what's the DASH diet. They get put on kind of a combination of that over the course of a three-year period of time. And they're going to be monitored very carefully to see how not only cardiovascular risk factors that are associated with uh, development of cognitive decline may be modified, but whether uh, other things that seem to be associated with the development of Alzheimer's disease, like inflammation um, and other things, may be modified. Um, and those results will be forthcoming sometime in the next many years. There are a variety of cognitive interventions that have been tested uh, and are ongoing with testing supported by our institute. Uh, one is something called the Synapse Study that Denise Park and colleagues reported out on a couple of years ago. This was a study that was looking at whether um, interventions uh, to really work the brain um, that lead to some sort of product like quilting or photography classes uh, had a beneficial effect on cognition that might be different from things like coming to a lecture at AAAS or doing a crossword puzzle or something of that sort. And what they found was that, yes, um, uh, taking photography lessons in particular seemed to have a beneficial effect on memory. Um, quilting, maybe not as much so, the combination of the two a little bit more, as opposed to going out for a social event, um, unfortunately, going to lectures, um, uh, for this particular test um, um, among the things that are being done. 
And of course, Dr. Albert went into detail about the active trial. This is, again, the study where people were tra taught things like how to um, uh, be more effective in reasoning or to speed up the process of, of looking at data. And it showed that people had benefits not only initially, but that were maintained for 10 years later. So a lot of different things looking at cognitive training. And then there are some studies that are looking at combinations of cognitive training, exercise, things of that sort. One way of looking at, is, at that is this recent report just came out in this last month or so by Festini and colleagues that looked at busyness. Um, so those of you who are feeling stressed out because it was hard to get here, you had so many things going on, good news for you. Um, in this study, what they did was to um, ask people simple questions like how busy are you on an average day, how often do you have too many things to do to actually get them done, how often do you have so many things to do that you go to bed later than your regular bedtime as a result of that, and it's on a scale of one to five, the higher, the busier you are, and they found in every component of cognition, whether it's episodic memory, reasoning, uh, crystallized knowledge, working memory, or processing speed, that the busier you were, the better. So it, again, as I said, good news for you who feel really busy. So that's just kind of a very superficial presentation of some of the things that we do know. What don't we know? Um, we don't know, as Dr. Albert said, what types of interventions are most effective, uh, how long they should last. You saw varying durations of interventions of the things that I just showed you. What sorts of combinations are most effective? And in particular, what's most effective for various individuals? Is there a difference for men, for women, for people who have a high school education versus not? Lots of questions that have yet to be answered. So what are we doing to try to get some of those answers? Well, we're doing a lot of things. Uh, one of them is that we have partnered with the McKnight Brain Research Foundation through the Foundation for NIH um, to develop a, a research program on cognition and aging. Um, through that collaboration, there have been a couple of summits on cognitive aging uh, in 2007 and 2010 that have led to um, funding uh, application solicitations from the National Institute on Aging in support of a number of projects that are trying to answer some of the questions that I just put forth. Additionally, again, as Dr. Albert had pointed out, uh, the McKnight Brain Foundation, along with our institute, AARP, the National Institute of Neurologic Disorders and Stroke, one of our sister institutes at NIH, the Retirement Research Foundation, and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention supported this uh, Institute of Medicine study that looked at cognitive aging, bringing together the latest information about uh, what we know to preserve cognition as one ages. And if you've not already looked at this, I would really encourage you to take a look at it. Uh, Dr. Albert was a member of that panel, and they have a number of really very nice um, uh, summaries of the state of the science uh, about cognitive aging. In addition, our institute has been uh, very privileged to get some extra funds this year to look at Alzheimer's disease. And we feel that uh, when you're thinking about this issue of Alzheimer's disease, what we think right now from the science is that people have cognitive uh, decline with aging, and then you have other people who have decre decrease in cognition that leads to what's called mild cognitive impairment and ultimately Alzheimer's disease and other sorts of dementias. And getting a better handle on those different trajectories and what makes it what makes for one person going one way versus another going another is very important. And thus, with some of the funds that have been, extra funds that have been allocated by Congress this year, we have a number of what's called fund, funding opportunity announcements. Uh, one of them is uh, calling for proposals to help us to understand Alzheimer's disease in the context of the aging brain. You know, what is it about an older person's brain that may, them, may make them more susceptible to the development of Alzheimer's disease and other types of dementias. Uh, we have another one that's calling for uh, big clinical trials to look at interventions similar to the sorts of interventions that I've already shown, or drugs, uh, or combinations of interventions to see whether they can make a difference in this known age-related cognitive decline or 
in the sorts of declines that are associated with Alzheimer's disease, and again, what are the differences in the pathways. Still another solicitation that we have out is for smaller pilot studies to get people ready to do those bigger clinical trials. Uh, and then finally, we have a solicitation for research in the epidemiology of Alzheimer's disease and uh, cognitive resilience. Again, Dr. Albert mentioned that earlier on, there were a number of, of, of large trials that have followed people over the course of time uh, that have given us some insight. What we're asking for is additional studies of that sort that will really get down to understanding what's happening uh, within the brain uh, of those individuals who ultimately end up with Alzheimer's disease versus those who are simply having um, uh, age-related cognitive decline. Uh, and each of these are open through um, the fiscal year uh, 2018, so there are going to be lots of opportunities for scientists to submit app, um, uh, proposals to help us to answer these questions. And then finally, I'd like to mention um, a project that uh, we've asked the Agency for Health Research and Quality and the Health and Medicine Division of the National Academy of Medicine, formerly known as the Institute of Medicine, uh, to embark upon on our behalf. Uh, we're very aware that the um, scientific community, the public, are really hungry for some good direction as to what you can do for um, particularly avoiding the mild cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease that we seem to see ever more frequently around us. Uh, and so what we've asked these two uh, groups to do is kind of in parallel um, to do an assessment of the science of the prevention strategies for Alzheimer's type dementia, amnestic mild cognitive impairment, and age-related cognitive decline. This overlaps a little bit, but not really fully at all with the previous IOM study, uh, because we're really interested in those first two questions. Um, the Agency for Health Research and Quality is uh, currently doing a very comprehensive literature review. Um, they will then be delivering that uh, review to uh, national, the National Academy's uh, committee from the Health and Medicine Division. Dr. Albert also serves on that committee. They will take a look at those data and make recommendations as to where, where the science really is and what can we definitively say at this point and what do we need to do next to be able to come up with real answers uh, for the public. Um, that report will be due out in the fall of 2017. Um, and there will be some intermittent opportunities for public comment as that uh, process evolves. So you might want to keep an eye out on the website for the National Academy of Medicine. So what did I say? Um, some things seem to work. Um, exactly what doses, what combinations, how they should, should be applied, it's still very unclear. And hopefully some of the science that we're currently supporting um, and that's being solicited through these uh, funding opportunity announcements will help us to get a clearer sense of that. Uh, and how much of this is applicable at all to the development of dementia is unclear. Uh, but hopefully, again, over the course of the next many years, we'll get a better sense of all of that. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bernard. While the uh, speakers are getting their lavalier mics on, I want to thank all of them. Uh, they uh, uniformly uh, respected the time allocations that I gave them, and I'm grateful. As any, I speak for organizers, moderators all over the world, uh, I'm sure, many of whom are probably in the audience. Um, so we're going to take a few minutes to have a conversation up here, and then we'll turn it over to, uh, to those of you in the audience. I. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not one to be shy of controversial issues, so let me raise this question for anyone who on the panel wants to take it. Is there any scientific evidence which points to um, significant differences between the male and the female brain when it comes to aging and cognition? Well, there, there are differences between the male and female brain throughout life. Uh, I would say there's not a lot of evidence of differential change. So as in general, 
women are, do better at verbal tasks and men do better at spatial tasks. And we see could that. You, could you make sure you're speaking into the mic? Maybe raise I can hold bit. it up. In, in general, um, men you. do better at spatial tasks and women do better at verbal tasks. And those differences occur when they're younger and they're maintained across the lifespan. Um, we all, of course, know people who don't follow that pattern. That's, that's a general statement about men and women, but we know women who are very good at science and math and men who are very good at spatial skills, but in general there are some sex differences, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, let me ask um, this question again. Any of the three of you want to tackle this one? Um, there has been, of course, a lot of discussion since the beginning of this century, which is not too long ago, about stem cell research, uh, and particularly uh, neuro stem cells. Talk about those for just a moment. Uh, to what extent is the government, McBurns, interested in supporting research uh, with regard to uh, the ability of stem cells to improve, maintain, preserve, whatever term you wish to use, uh, cognitive ability as we age. Do you see that, does NIA see that as a promising field somewhere down the line? We certainly have had, can you hear me? We've certainly had an initiative um, that is ongoing looking at induced, what's called induced pluripotent stem cells, where you take a cell, you make it go back to being a stem cell and then get it re-derived as a, a neural cell. Um, and the idea there is to get a better understanding in the petri dish, uh, what sorts of changes that are associated with the development of pathologies such as Alzheimer's disease, et cetera. Um, in fact, one of our researchers was supposedly developed uh, Alzheimer's in a dish <laughs> as a result of, the, of, the, of that sort of intervention. So it absolutely is part of the armamentarian in hel helping to understand what's going on, uh, but there's so many different factors. Uh, and in fact, um, the brain initiative that's uh, being uh, led uh, throughout NIH, um, particularly by the Neuroscience Institute, is looking at not only how cells work, but how the various neurons interact with each other and how the networks all work together to get a better understanding of the development of various pathologies. Dr. Albert, did you want yeah, to add? I, I, would, I would just add that um, you can imagine that putting a stem cell in a heart that's not doing very well might work better because all the cells in the heart are very similar. The big complication with looking at the brain is how different all the cells are and how elaborately connected they are to one another and how different parts of the brain have different functions. And so using a stem cell approach for aging changes or diseases like Alzheimer's disease is going to be much, much harder mm -hmm. than it is for things perhaps related to something like heart muscle. Uh, Dr. Yassar, um, you mentioned about something about the POCD effect and the anesthesia uh, that I wanted to just get qualified. You said the risk was higher among those with less education. There were three factors there, but one of them was less education. Why is that the case? What's going on in the brain? Well, there is an entity called, I think we know for, for cognitive impairment, lower education actually, it's an increase, uh, increases your risk. And I think the theories, and Dr. Albert can of course <laughs> talk more about that, is that when you have a higher education, you're more used to, you know, for exercising your brain daily and doing your homework and also at, uh, helps you with your mental flexibility to, if there is a problem, your brain is used to do problem solving. And I think, and uh, due to that, that helps you later, in the later years when you lose brain cells, that maybe through that mechanism when you had a higher education and your brain is used to alternative routes, that you can uh, handle, you know, the brain, the loss of brain cells better and you're still cognitively quite intact. And I think that's very similar to uh, after you know surgery, when you have an anesthetic, there is a sudden big blow to your brain, and I think when you, your brain is used to to do a detour and find alternative routes to work, uh, then maybe you're doing better. So should should we all be asking our anesthesiologists before surgery as to why they're proposing this particular drug as opposed to another drug? Should we worry about that? 
So I think it's always very and always ask rule number one. So and I think it's absolutely so. There's a the general anesthesia is definitely a concern, and I didn't. I didn't have the time, so I didn't ex uh, talk more about it. But there's an alternative, maybe. Can it be done under local anesthetics with sedation? Of course, there are also medications used. But that should be definitely a kind of uh, discussion in people. And maybe if you're healthy and you're doing fine, maybe not as much worry. But if you already have some cognitive impairment and you have a family member, that should be, I think, definitely a, a, a discussion. I see people in my clinic after they have a surgery, surgical procedure, very often they have significant cognitive impairment afterwards. And if you're lucky, they recover. So I think it's, it should be part of the discussion. Hmm. Dr. Albert, did you want to? OK. So uh, uh, let me. Uh, <clears throat> ask this about what's going on in other countries in terms of research. I mean, who are, uh, which are some of the countries, leading countries besides the United States who are really making advances in the study of aging? I mean, I, I can start. I can certainly say that worldwide um, there is interest in aging and cognition um, well demonstrated by collaborations that have been uh, developed. There's uh, something called the Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Initiative that has not only involvement of the United States and Canada, but replication in Europe, in Japan, et cetera. Um, there's the Alzheimer's Association International Conference. And again, I'm talking Alzheimer's, but the interest is in cognition, and, and Dr. Uh, Albert has been a real leader in that, um, looking at early issues. Um, did you want to elaborate on that, Marilyn? Well, uh, we have, for example, a collaboration of scientists around the United States with scientists in Australia that are very interested in the very earliest phases of Alzheimer's disease. I would say, in general, one of the things that I love about working in this area is the amount of collaboration and cooperation that exists. I think we all feel that these are really big problems that have to be solved, and we have to work together to solve them as quickly as we can. Um, I've been, I, I, I used to say how long I've been working in this field. Now I say for 100 years I've been doing it. <laughs> but I've been doing it a long time, and we're making progress more slowly than I would like. And so we all work together to try to get answers to these important issues. Okay, well, I have one last question. So if people would like to go to the mics uh, and prepare uh, their questions, we'll get to them in just a moment. This, is, I, this may be somewhat tongue in cheek, but, but it's not totally irrelevant. Uh, Dr. Bernard, you mentioned, I believe, that Congress has recently given NIA a little budget hike, if you will, to do some of this research. Have, has anybody done a study of the relationship between Congress's generosity as it gets older? In, in terms of aging and Alzheimer's disease? I like that. All right, that was tongue in cheek. You don't have to answer that. Uh, okay, well, we have, wow, a lot of people, so let's start here, then I'll go there, and then, et cetera. Please identify yourself, your affiliation, and then if it's directed to a particular person, let them know that at the beginning. Uh, my name is Mary Fraker. I'm affiliated with myself. I'm a freelance writer if anybody needs me. Um, my <laughs> I have a question about two different types of interventions. Um, one is, what about learning a foreign language or coding, you know, programming? And the other is, what was it about photography that was so much better than quilting? Because I don't want to take up photography as a hobby, but I'd rather do something that is more like photography and less like quilting. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so we had two questions, right? Go ahead. I I'll start with the photography versus quilting, and I can say that the uh, scientists are still trying to sort that out. You would think that you know, if it's an issue of having to produce something, in both cases, you're doing that. So it's it's not totally clear. I have my personal, you know, not substantiated wonder question as to, you know, are the people who are attracted to quilting people who previously had experience to some, with, with something like that, so it was not as much of a challenge for learning as opposed to the photography. I don't know. Uh, and it certainly deserves further evaluation. But, uh, yeah. well, what, what I tend to tell people is that it's important for them to do something that they love because it means they'll maintain it. So just to be mentally active and physically active, but doing the thing that you love, because if you only do it for a short period of time, it's clearly not going to be beneficial. 
Yes, please. And I think just to address the first question about the multiple languages, uh, there were a couple of observational studies and they found that actually when you speak more than two languages, that, that delays the onset for Alzheimer's disease. There wasn't a limit how many languages, so I don't know the dose response curve. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe if it's five, it's too many. And there was no information, at least what my own, from the quick reading is, you know, is it still beneficial when you start at age 50 or when you, you know, from like me, I grew up with many languages, so I feel lucky. Uh, and so if, it, if it's only beneficial when you are bilingual as of a young age or when you started later, my guess and my gut feeling is uh, do even when you're 60, 70, any new language, any new cognitive activity, it can only help you. But remember something that's mentioned in George, one of George Bernard Shaw's plays, I can't remember which one, who had a character who had uh, the ability to speak in 57 languages but was described by his friends as having nothing of interest to say in either of them. <laughs> uh, so war is not necessarily better. Yes, over here. I'd like to thank you very much for, I hope you'll come back again and, and continue to uh, talk to us. But. Uh, I do have a, a few questions. Uh, number one, it, when, what baseline age would you uh, suggest that perhaps every human being could have their brain uh, you know, scanned so that we have a baseline to know what we might have going on in our brain? I mean, to me, how else can we be, be proactive with our health care? Number two is, I think, isn't there an area of the brain that Alzheimer affects? And so I was just curious about if the stem cell was going into directly that area that seems to show uh, the color more. Um, I guess the definition of what exactly constitutes cognitive decline, the fact that you can't remember the, the person's name but you can see the face or something, I, I, it confuses me. I'm 71 and I, I, uh, I would like to keep going that I get bothered that I have a brain freeze every now and then. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Please. Those are a whole lot of questions. I'll try to remember at least one of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I wouldn't necessarily recommend having imaging at a particular age, but I would definitely recommend having some sort of brief assessment of cognitive function. That would give you a baseline. And then following that over time. I mean, now in the the new healthcare program as part of the wellness visit, one of the things we try to encourage physicians to do is to evaluate cognition so that they can follow it. I don't, don't know if Seville wants to say something about that. Yeah, uh, it's actually part of it's the American Geriatric Society recommends it, you know, at a, a visit. And actually there's an effort from the Alzheimer's Association, they gave actually a little grant to find out what is the best way. So a screening for cognitive, you know, function cognitive decline is very important. And not only just to see that we can prescribe medication, but from my point of view, there's a safety concern if somebody, you know, doesn't forget to take their medication or takes them twice. So definitely over age 65 at least, we would like to, to screen. And now the wellness visit, what Dr. Albert just pointed to, it's covered by Medicare, uh, which means it's just not for, just for screening. And, and they, they recommend that screening for cognitive uh, function or cognitive decline or impairment, however we word it, should be part of it. And I'd, I'd just like to jump in and say that um, for people who are um, older and um, at cognitively intact, but maybe having cognitive decline of aging, um, there is always the opportunity to participate in clinical trials. Um, we have a need for people who are cognitively normal to serve as controls in uh, various studies. And uh, I would just say, please go to nia.nih.gov or um, and, and look around and, and see what the opportunities are because uh, we, we need your help. The, uh, I mean, in, in order to get every, give everyone a chance who's standing now by the mics, I might ask if he would just ask one question of our panelists uh, because we're going to break around seven. Over here, please, you're next. Well, Rex, I had two. <laughs> <laughs> Should have gotten up faster. All right, the easy question, I think. This is for Dr. Yasser. I was interested in your discussion of that meta-analysis about polypharmacy and statins and benzodiazepines and so forth. 
and i hearken back to your comment about how means don't tell you a whole lot because they're an average and there is in fact a lot of variation so with particular regard to those drugs such as the statins where you said there was no ill effect that was noted on average what is the variation what is the range what is the distribution look like in other words there may be a great deal of individual variation in response to those drugs and whereas over the entire population there may not be an ill effect they may very well be a significant problem for selected individuals well you're right i mean very often when we do these these or when we look at the studies for medications we are looking for the overall the population and the uh, and the mean and that we can measure that is you know what it shows the uh, the graph that it's not by chance but it's really there is a trend but we cannot tease out every person because there are the people and that's what the variation uh, shows there will be people where there is an effect but I think it's just when you look at the overall population when you give guidelines uh, that is what you say so if I in my clinic when there are people they report and it should be then, you know, really a strong history that I did fine, and then my doctor started me on the statin, and then boom, after that I just couldn't remember, you know, names or information. There could be a concern, and then, then you just stop the medication, of course, make sure it's not for primary stroke prevention. I mean, put everything together, but that's the one way you can find out from each person separately that if that for that particular person, that may be a, a, a drug you should not be on. So I, I agree with your concern, but particularly this is a large meta-analysis. You know, it was 40,000 people. So, and there was not really even a, a little sign, but it, it, there was not really a big sign that it could be harmful. So I think there may be few people, yes, but for the overall generation, when I talk to my patient, that will what I will tell them, that you can take the statins, as far as we know, it does not affect your cognition. But listen to your patients. Thank you for your one question. We appreciate Thank you. it. Over here. Hi, my name is Fenyan Lee, and I'm from the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. Um, uh, my question is actually uh, related to diet. Uh, you guys have mentioned about um, you know some of the uh, things that are beneficial to cognition, such as the med things from the Mediterranean diet. Um, my question is related to like, do we know what is harmful? Like. What in our diet is actually promoting cognitive decline, um, especially considering the close connection between Alzheimer's and some of the uh, chronic diseases such as obesity and um, atherosclerosis, and uh, as well as diabetes. Okay, who wants to? I mean, we definitely know from saturated fats. You know, those are the no-nos. So, so those are uh, bad. Uh, and that we know it's harmful for cardiovascular risk factors. Uh, in terms of for cognition, in terms of the carbohydrates, we don't really have too many studies or information on that, knowing, but although the DASH diet is one of the diets where they really try to avoid the carbohydrates, but so far what we know in terms of cardiovascular risk factors and atherosclerosis, the saturated fat, the high fat diet is absolutely uh, detrimental. And, and we know something about vitamin deficiencies, right? So we know that if you're, if low in vitamin B12, for example, that that's not good for your cognition. We don't know that lots of eating lots of good things is going to make it better, but we do know that absence of certain substances will make it worse. Over here. Hi, my name is Brian Bingham. I'm a second year AAAS fellow, uh, former neuroscientist. Um, Dr. Albert, you talked uh, a little bit about the individual differences in, in cognitive decline over, over aging. Um, are there physiological uh, cellular molecular mechanisms that tr tend to track with those individual differences? And if so, do these interventions, um, are they protective for those mechanisms or are they compensatory by bringing on other pathways or other mechanisms? So that, that's a good question. Um, we think that most of the changes that are happening with age are changes at the level of the connections of the brain cells, at the level of the synapses, and in modulation of the pathways throughout the brain. Um, we don't, for the interventions that occur, we can see that there are improvements in networks in the brain, 
but you know we're just beginning to deal with what networks are are changing and what kinds of interventions are very beneficial so in lots of these trials people are looking at for instance functional connectivity between the brain between regions in the brain and whether or not a particular intervention is impacting that we just have an awful lot more that we need to learn but we believe that it's in the modulation and the connections between nerve cells that most of these changes are occurring thank you over here oh <coughs> Olive Hopkins retired. I wanted to ask about the effects of alcohol on memory. And, you know, most people think that red wine is very good for you. And I just wonder if this, is, if this has any effect on memory long term. So the data suggests that small levels of alcohol are actually beneficial, but the type doesn't matter. <laughs> if it's red wine or white wine or beer or whatever, I don't know if Marie yeah. wants to say something. And, and I would say that we do have a study that the uh, National Institute on Alcoholism and Alcohol Abuse has launched and NIA is supporting uh, that's going to be looking at, you know, what is the impact of daily alcohol intake in older adults um, in lots of different parameters. So in a few years, we may have a more definitive answer for you, but that's getting started. But I, I'm sure you realize that large levels of alcohol are not good for the brain. <laughs> okay, uh, again, please focus on your question over here. Hi, uh, Jonathan Drake with AAAS. Um, over the last uh, few years, maybe a decade or so, a number of electronic uh, games and now apps for your phone and iPad have come out making rather grandiose claims about their ability to improve your cognition and uh, you know, to the extent that they're allowed by law, some even imply at least that they can stave off certain things like that. Um, I was wondering, is there any clinical evidence to suggest that that sort of thing is effective? And if so, which games? Asking for a friend. <laughs> <laughs> this is where we disclose what we oh own. <laughs> I don't know. Do you want to say something? Yeah, you know, I, I can certainly say that um, it's certainly a point of uh, uh, lively discussion, oftentimes at NIA. Um, studies such as the ACT of study um, suggest that you can train certain domains, and there may be a little bit of crossover uh, in instrumental activities of daily living. How many of the games that are out there are truly based upon that? You know, it's not clear. Um, so that's the best I can say about it. What would you like to say? Well, most of the games that are being promoted have only been studied for a very short period of time. We know that if you practice on something over a short period of time, you're going to get better. The real question is whether or not doing it over a long time and long-term follow-up is different. And that's why the active study is the thing that we cite all the time because it, it clearly does look as if a series of cognitive activities are beneficial and beneficial over the long term, but it doesn't necessarily mean that a game would be better than you know, the, the kinds of simple things that were done in active, for example. Uh, you notice that they didn't mention any particular games. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, all right, the last three questions, please go ahead. Okay. Uh, John Gordon here. I'm interested in the activity of uh, mental activity in older people. Uh, you mentioned doing crossword puzzles, which, although it's ter not terribly uh, instructive in the sense of uh, a lot of variation in what you do, uh, it's very active. Uh, whereas uh, studying online or video courses uh, may involve more uh, effort to try to absorb new knowledge than doing crossword puzzles. But on the other hand, you don't have homework, you don't have to write term papers or pass exams. So you don't have that active component. And I, I'm wondering what is your sense? I realize there are no studies and you can't cite uh, sources for this, but what's your impression of the value of studying something where you don't have to give adequate feedback, but it expands your mind, versus doing something that's more active, but less mind expanding. I, 
I, Just I, an I, easy I, one, you know. Uh, yes. <laughs> I, I guess I always come back to what's important is doing something that you love because you'll keep doing it. I'm not sure that we know enough about the comparison between these different <coughs> kinds of things that you're describing. I, I think if, if you find something that you love to do and you keep on doing it, the evidence suggests that that will be most beneficial so far. Okay. I don't know if that doesn't Thank necessarily you. answer your question. but Okay, next question, please. Hi, Joshua Solomon, uh, postdoc at Georgetown University. Uh, what do you believe may be a possible uh, link between irritability and irascibility and uh, potential cognitive, cognitive uh, decline, uh, including uh, Alzheimer's disease? Is it, could it be uh, one causing the other, or could it be a symptom of, of uh, cognitive, cognitive uh, decline? Especially uh, that, if uh, this sure irritability may ability. have developed in uh, middle age, not necessarily in elder age. Okay. Do you need that repeat, any part repeated, or can you go ahead and answer? Well, I mean, we know from the old, an older generation, older population, that you know, one or two years before even the onset of any cognitive impairment or Alzheimer's disease, you can have any type of neuropsychiatric symptoms. So it can involve irritability or any type of, you know, anxiety. So uh, it's not a cause. We don't know it's not a cause, but we think it's a, an as accompanying symptom. So, but we don't know middle age. I don't know that there are any studies. I haven't, at least I haven't seen evaluating middle, you know, changes in in personality or or some neuropsychiatric symptoms. Can that be a predictor? I don't know. Okay. Last question, please. I wanted to ask if there was anything sort of um, thrilling. Um, on the horizon in the research world because, um, I mean, I certainly understand that over the next however many years people are going to figure out which kind of exercise we should actually do, but that didn't really strike me as, um, oh, sorry. Did you, did you hear the, the no, all right, you're going to have to speak exercise. directly into the mic, please. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I wanted to ask if there was anything particularly um, exciting or thrilling or, um, you know, uh, far out there in the research pipeline because I, it, from what I heard you say, people were going to be looking at exactly what kind of exercise we should all be doing or people were asking things like what kind of games we should be playing and none of that struck me as, let's say, revolutionary and I just wondered if there was anything on the horizon that would be somehow very, very uh, amazing if it, full, it came to fulfillment. Well, I actually think it is exciting to know that there are things that people can do in their daily life that might make a difference in terms of maintaining mental ability. I don't think what we want is to find a drug that we would give to somebody who's middle-aged and might help them maintain their brain. I think what we would love to have is to know what kinds of activities, be they physical or mental or social engagement or vascular risk factor controlling, that could really make a difference. And we're beginning to get a handle on those things and we're beginning to study those factors individually and in combination. And to me, that is exciting because it means that it's something that everybody could do and it's not gonna be a magic bullet, but it really has the possibility that you could enable lots of older people to maintain their mental abilities into old age. Well, I think I'd like to end at that note. That's a little bit of optimism that we can all use. Thank you. Please. Uh, <laughs>